Hey, I'll Scott Horton here. It's always safe to say that one should keep at least some of your savings in precious metals as a hedge against inflation. And if this economy ever does heat back up and the banks start expanding credit, rising prices could make metals a very profitable bet. Since 1977, Robertson Roberts Brokerage Inc. has been helping people buy and sell gold, silver, platinum, and palladium, and they do it well. They're fast, reliable, and trusted for more than 35 years. And they take Bitcoin. Call Robertson Roberts at 1-800-874-9760 or stop by rrbi.co. All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. This is my show, The Scott Horton Show. Full interview archives at scotthorton.org. More than 3,500 of them now going back to 2003. Sign up for the podcast feeds there and all that if you want. Interviews only or the whole show archives. Follow me on Twitter at Scott Horton Show. All right, our guest today is Tony Camerino. Uh, you might know him as Matthew Alexander, who wrote the book Kill or Capture, uh, and also How to Break, I think this was the first one, How to Break a Terrorist, the U.S. interrogator who used brains, not brutality, to take down the deadliest man in Iraq. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing, Tony? I'm good. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing real good. Uh, I don't know if you even remember. We spoke uh, once about, I don't know, seven or eight years ago or whenever uh, you originally wrote that article for the Washington Post, I believe it was. Um, and I regret that I have not read your books, although uh, certainly they should be on the pile of books that I need to read. Uh, no doubt about that. But uh, appreciate you joining us on the show. And, uh, and the reason why I have you on is because you've come up in conversation over the last few days um, about uh, the motivation for terrorist attacks. And, uh, of course, uh, the, the narrative about the French attack is that, uh, for example, George Packer in The New Yorker uh, wrote a piece. And, and the answer is that, you know, all you need to know is Salman Rushdie. Uh, the truth is, Islam is just intolerant of free speech, and so this was an attack by Islam against free speech, and that's just about it. And yet, uh, there's a personal history of the now dead uh, terrorist attackers that's being told by the French police, which, uh, you know, seem to indicate that perhaps they had earthly political reasons for th some of the things they did, including apparently there was a documentary that profiled the older brother who was an aspiring rapper and who was clearly not a religious pious type at all back when he was trying to go and fight in Iraq 10 years ago. And... Um, so I was just wondering, uh, you know, what's your initial impression of what's going on here? Uh, and, and do you have any insight you think that, that we could learn about, uh, you know, what this attack on this uh, French magazine means in the context of the broader war on terrorism? Uh, well, well, it's interesting, uh, but, but not surprising. I mean, these type of uh, attacks, I think, are going to continue, and we're, we're going to see more of them, I, I, I believe. Um, and, and and it's not surprising. I mean, we are technically at war. Uh, you know, we do have combat troops um, in both Iraq and in Afghanistan, and uh, in all countries that are participating in those conflicts, I think, or are in, in any way supporting them, can expect that there are going to be you know retaliatory attacks. And the the question of what motivates these two individuals, um, it's it's hard to speculate at this point. Um, what I can tell you just from my experience having interrogated in Iraq is that uh, individuals who decide to join extremist groups do it for a variety of reasons. Um, but most of those, the majority of those reasons aren't religious. The, the majority of those reasons typically come down to socioeconomic uh, reasons. Um, and, and so you see that a lot of the recruits that are that make it into these extremist organizations are people that were disenfranchised by their societies, um, by the culture in which they lived in, and uh, for, either, for either economic reasons or social reasons, decided to go and join this, you know, the, some of these violent groups. All right now, um, yeah, I guess I kind of screwed up on your introduction there. I meant to explain for for people who don't remember that you were an interrogator. In the Iraq War, uh, it says here in your bio you supervise over 1,300 interrogations in Iraq. And uh, the reason that uh, you came public in the first place was to try to explain that in your uh, experience, uh, basically treating 
captives well was a much better way to get quality information out of them than brutalizing them. And uh, I believe the story goes that's how you found the uh, gained the intelligence that led to the targeting, the successful targeting and killing of Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, the founder of al-Qaeda in Iraq. Is that correct? Yeah, you know, my, my primary approach was to get to know people. Uh, that was that was kind of my bread and butter, get to know people, understand what motivates them, why they joined al-Qaeda in the first place. And then once you knew that, then you could decide on a technique, an interrogation technique, um, a non-coercive technique that would, in, in some way, apply an incentive that would convince them to cooperate with you and to abandon al-Qaeda. And that incentive, you know, in 90% of cases was intangible. It was, it was either reaffirmation of some grievance they felt, uh, or sometimes just straight compassion and uh, understanding for why they had uh, decided to join al-Qaeda. Um, but but that, was, that was my approach, and what I found is that... Uh, a lot of interrogators were making the mistake of assuming that everybody who had joined al-Qaeda had done so for religious reasons, that it was because they hated our culture or because they believed in uh, Osama bin Laden's very radical beliefs, and that's why they had joined al-Qaeda. But that was always just a facade. You know, uh, there, there are a few cases where there are hardcore religious um, or believers in very hardcore religious beliefs that uh, who had joined for religious reasons, but even even those guys, I believe, if you really dig back, even for instance, Zarqawi, um, if you go back to his history, you'll find that it's not actually rooted in religion. It's it was rooted in criminality and social injustice as he saw it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah, but, a very important point on him, in particular. Sorry to interrupt, but yeah, he was just a two bit rapist. Uh, Zarqawi was until he was tortured by America's king in Jordan. And that was when he decided to grow up and get serious about life and, and decided he wanted to go to Afghanistan and, and see if he could get into some real trouble. Yeah, and, and, and let's not forget, you know, uh, a lot of times when we look at some of these acts that are committed by members of al-Qaeda, um, the, the more gruesome ones, every every organization has criminals in it, right? I mean... Uh, some of the some of the members of Al Qaeda certainly are just they're some of them are truly psychopathic criminals um, and commit very heinous acts. But you know we have that in the U.S. military too, and, and not to say that we're the same, but we do have criminals in the military who commit heinous acts, and we've seen that in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Al Qaeda does too. But it'd be a mistake to say that everyone who commits these heinous acts in Al Qaeda represents the strong ideological religious um, arm of that organization. Right. So, for instance, in Iraq, the large majority of members of al-Qaeda um, were Sunnis who were moderate religiously but had joined al-Qaeda for weapons uh, and money. Um, and now, with a group like ISIS, I believe you have a very large um, and stronger faction at the top of religious radicals, mm-hmm. but that religious, those religious and radical beliefs were formed in, in American prisons in Iraq now, because of torture. When, you, when you're talking about the al-Qaeda in Iraq, circa, what are we talking, 05, 06 here, basically? Uh, well, are you talking the beginning or when I was there? Yeah, I mean, in your experience. I was there in 06. Right. Yeah. Okay, so, um, now, uh, wow, you got 1,300 interrogations done just in the first half or, or just in that one year? Or, that's a lot. Um, in five months, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now, when we talk about AQI, how, do you, how exactly do you define it? Because... Uh, sometimes that meant any foreigner who traveled to Iraq to fight. Sometimes it meant the entire Sunni-based insurgency. Uh, sometimes it meant just those who actually are working for Zarqawi uh, and that kind of thing. And I wonder how specific you are about that. And I wonder whether you notice when the Libyans, the Syrians, the Saudis, and whoever, uh, whatever other foreign fighters came to fight, uh, were they any more religious or they were just as motivated by secular politics uh, you know, earthly reasons, I mean to say, um, not so much secular, but you know what I mean, uh, yeah. earthly reasons as the Iraqis who were fighting with them? You know, it really depends. Uh, it really depends on the person's background. Um, in in Iraq, there was, you know, I, I think at one point over 20 separate insurgent groups. You know, you, you had... Um, well, I can't even start the 1920s brigade. You had so many different groups that were operating there. But many of those groups were actually associated 
and or formed really within the tribal structure. So if a certain tribe said, okay, we're not going to join the government because of debathification or because of the disbanding of the army or because of the Shia militias and we're going to defend ourselves, we're going to join our group and we're going to give it a name. I'm sorry, and, i got to interrupt you. we got to take sure. this break. It's Tony Camerino, uh, a.k.a. Matthew Alexander, a rec war interrogator. Be right back. Hey, all Scott here. If you're like me, you need coffee. Lots of it. And you probably prefer it tastes good, too. Well, let me tell you about Darren's Coffee Company at darrenscoffee.com. Darren Marion is a natural entrepreneur who decided to leave his corporate job and strike out on his own, making great coffee. And Darren's Coffee is now delivering right to your door. Darren gets his beans direct from farmers around the world. All specialty, premium grade, with no filler. Hey, the man just wants everyone to have a chance to taste this great coffee. Darren'sCoffee.com. Use promo code SCOTT and you get free shipping. Darren'sCoffee.com. All right, you guys, welcome back. I'm Scott Horton. I'm talking with Tony Camerino, a.k.a. Matthew Alexander. He is a fellow at the Burkle Center at UCLA. Go Bruins! And uh, he's the author of How to Break a Terrorist and Kill or Capture about his time in Iraq uh, as an interrogator there. And now... um, so I want to get back to, well, I'm sorry, you were interrupted in the middle of what you were saying. You remember where you were? Yeah, I was, I was talking about the, uh, the various insurgent groups that had grown up in Iraq. Right, right. Uh, after our invasion, and that many of them were aligned with tribes. Uh, but the, when, when you look at al-Qaeda in Iraq, really the majority of it was groups that had decided through the Sunni tribes to, to join al-Qaeda really at, because it was a marriage of convenience. The Sunni tribes needed weapons and money to defend themselves from the the Shia militias that were being allowed to run free by the central government, in some ways sponsored by the central government, and uh, and Al Qaeda provided that. And 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 you also saw that you know when Petraeus came in and, and paid the tribes and gave them weapons, how quickly they disbanded from Al Qaeda. It pretty much tells you that the majority of them had no religious um, affiliations with Al Qaeda. They really had joined for practical reasons. Yeah. And now, um, so when you talk about uh, the, uh, you said at the beginning, it seemed like the, the primary under, underwriting motivation here was uh, socioeconomic problems uh, by the volunteers? Yeah, if you, look at, uh, if you look at Iraq in particular, the majority of oil in Iraq is in Shia land. It's along the border with Iran in the south, uh, east. Um, right, there's the rest some is up, up in Kurdistan. Kurdistan. There's some up in Kurdistan. Um, and there's some processing that happens in in, uh, in Baji and in places in in Sunni territory, but for the most part, there's very little oil in Sunni uh, Iraq. Uh, and so, you know, under Saddam, they were guaranteed some of the oil revenue, right, that would be distributed to them through the central government. But now, with a Shia-led government uh, and in a democracy um, that's there now, there is no guarantee that they will get any of that revenue. And that that is really truly what the what the conflict in Iraq comes down to is those Sunni tribes in the north and west have to be able to feed their families, and there is very little industry outside of oil for them to be able to do that. And as long as the central government is not going to share that oil revenue with them, they are going to turn to groups like ISIS or Al Qaeda that will allow them to try to take that revenue by force. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that ship's already sailed by now, but that'd be a whole different direction for the conversation. I want to uh, get back to what you had said previously about, I guess, primarily in reference to the foreign fighters who had come to join and fight under Zarqawi or otherwise for the Sunni base insurgency back then, that it was, according to them, in, in your interrogations, it was the pictures of the torture from Abu Ghraib and uh, the pictures of the guys in the orange jumpsuits being held without trial at Guantanamo Bay, that was what really motivated so many of these guys to uh, go ahead and, and make the trip to Iraq to fight. Yeah, and, and, and let's remember, they didn't need pictures. I mean, the pictures certainly poured flames on everything, but there was, at least within Iraqis and uh, for other foreigners who had been captured by U.S. forces in Iraq in the early days, you know, they experienced the torture and word got out. Um, so, because it's, you know, it wasn't just Abu Ghraib. It wasn't just you know one place here or there. Remember, at one point, Donald Rumsfeld had authorized enhanced interrogation techniques, aka torture and abuse, to be used by all. And and uh, and when and even after they rescinded that permission, many units continued to use them uh, because 
the, the justification that was given to them was, well, you can use these because it'll save lives. So even after they were rescinded, people thought, well, if, if it's okay to torture, if Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld say it's okay to torture to save lives, then, you know, why not? They're saying it's okay. Mm-hmm. So this widespread, uh, and, and I'm not going to say that, you know, the, I think less, I think the number of interrogators who tortured was less than a majority. I think, I, I think even many interrogators who were permitted or allowed to use these techniques refused to use them. But there were enough cases that it became well known within uh, Iraq among the insurgents, among the foreign fighters, among Iraqis that had been captured that Americans used torture. Uh, and they abused prisoners, and that that spread very quickly. And, and the photos from Abu Ghraib and what happened at Guantanamo Bay was just more fuel on the fire, you know. Yep. Yeah, you know, and, I remember incredibly even uh, you know anti-war reporters like Aaron Glantz uh, reporting for Democracy Now. He had no problem saying, "Hey, I'm here in Tikrit, and these people, I, I can't lie to you, they're happy that America invaded and got Saddam for them, but they don't trust us." And, and I'm talking about right after the invasion. They don't trust right. us, and they're and they're looking at us sideways. And we have a very short window of opportunity to 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 show that we mean what we say about how much we love them. And it seems like that window is already closing here pretty quick. And it it wasn't very long before they came to really realize. Um, well, and I think uh, you know, as Matthew Ho has said on the show, that even in the highest level discussions of military intelligence, whatever, the debate was still framed as it's the people of Iraq versus the terrorists. And what you say about, well, the Sunni tribes were being cut out of the oil wealth and all this, uh, which, I mean, that kind of analysis was being discussed on my little pirate radio show back then as well, um, that they wouldn't talk about stuff like that. They really framed it just as the terrorists. So anybody you're torturing is a terrorist, so go ahead and torture them. And they were creating all their own enemies with this brutality from the get-go. Yeah, I don't think we can say that, you know, America didn't create ISIS. Uh, Zarqawi created, you know, al-Qaeda in Iraq, which later became ISIS, but we certainly added the fuel that allowed it to ignite and then prosper later in, in Syria and move into Iraq um, by using torture. And, and you know, my, my unit in particular, we tracked foreign fighters that we captured and uh, did interviews, you know, and, and assessed why they had come to fight, and the number one reason they they briefed every new interrogator on this, the number one reason they had come to fight was because of torture and abuse uh, at Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo. And by the way, does that places. count for any Europeans? Uh, we, I I don't remember us ever capturing any Europeans because, of um, course, the story that they're saying about the French shooter, the older brother, was that he was arrested trying to go to fight in Iraq uh, in 2005 and told the judge he was motivated by the pictures of the torture and the abuse. And here was a guy who was a, a rapper and a, everything but a devout religious uh, uh, fundamentalist uh, who you know, claimed then that that's what he was motivated by was American policy. Yeah, well, well this isn't a surprise, right? Because the 9-11 hijackers had very strong ties to Europe, right? Um, the millennial bomber uh, was French Algerian, had had lived in France for for a number of years. Richard Reed um, had passed through France and spent time there. So, you know, th- there's th- there's there's plenty of uh, seeds of radical Islam uh, in Europe, um, and 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 many of those are fueled by obviously our foreign policies and some of the the awful mistakes we've made in the Middle East. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you know, I guess I don't really have a very good uh, thumb on the pulse of what things were really like in the Middle East before. But Michael Scheuer, I guess, warned beforehand and has said since that American policy has radicalized a generation uh, where it just didn't have to happen at all. And, well, 3,000 uh, radicals before 9-11 and probably 50,000, 60,000 now. Yeah. You know, that yeah. pretty much tells you what our policy has accomplished. Yeah, where these guys are basically the nutcase ranting on the street corner that nobody cares about until all of a sudden things are on fire and people are dying and screaming and he seems prescient because I told you this was going to happen, he says, and they, and, and he has the explanation for why it happened and everything, which makes them the kind of the perfect mirror image of the war party here. And they already have an explanation. It's the Islam makes them do it so much, you know? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I think you know my perspective is that it's not really about religion. The religion is just the it's just the excuse. It's really about social social conditions and economics. I never met the guy, you know, in in Iraq of all the foreign fighters that we interrogated and all all the people we talked to. I never met the guy who was like, you know, woke up one day and was like, jihad. That's the reason I'm going to Iraq to fight. Right. It's never it's never just religion. It's always you know I uh, another if, reason. If if we can make it a little bit more complicated, did any of them decide that that religion, that their religion was so opposed to our way of life that that was what made them go and fight? That we let our daughters wear mini skirts to junior college and to vote in primary elections and these kinds of things and R-rated movies and this is why we had to pay? No, no. I mean that that just never happens. Really. I mean, even if you look at if you look at Osama bin Laden's three demands prior to 9-11, none of them had to do with really American culture. They were U.S. support to Israel. They were the presence of U.S. troops in Saudi Arabia and uh, U.S. support for monarchies in the Middle East that he considered to be corrupt. That None of those reasons had anything to do with culture. Now, that's not to say he didn't dislike our culture or that you know, some of these fundamentalists do resent our culture, um, and especially you know, with regards to women's rights. Um, but but those aren't the political reasons for why they've they've uh, turned to violence. Right. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time and coming back on the show, Tony. And I sure hope I have a chance to get to your book sometime soon. Yeah, <laughs> give it a try. <laughs> I will appreciate. All right. It. All right. Thank you. All right, y'all. That's Tony Camerino. He uh, formerly was known as Matthew Alexander, the pseudonymous author of How to Break a Terrorist and Kill or Capture. And he's now a fellow at the Burkle Center at UCLA. We'll be right back in just a sec. What was the only interest group in D.C. pushing war with Syria last summer? AIPAC and the Israel lobby. What's the only interest group in D.C. pushing to sabotage the nuclear deal with Iran right now? AIPAC and the Israel lobby. Why doesn't the president force an end to the occupation of Palestine, a leading cause of terrorist attacks against the United States? AIPAC and the Israel lobby. The Council for the National Interest is pushing back putting America first and educating the people about what's really at stake in the Middle East. Help support their important work at CouncilForTheNationalInterest.org. Hey, all Scott Horton here. It's always safe to say that one should keep at least some of your savings in precious metals as a hedge against inflation. And if this economy ever does heat back up and the banks start expanding credit, rising prices could make metals a very profitable bet. Since 1977, Robertson Roberts Brokerage, Inc. has been helping people buy and sell gold, silver, platinum, and palladium, and they do it well. They're fast, reliable, and trusted for more than 35 years. And they take Bitcoin. Call Robertson Roberts at 1-800-874-9760 or stop by rrbi.co. Hey everybody, Scott Horton here. Ever think maybe your group should hire me to give a speech? Well, maybe you should. I've got a few good ones to choose from, including How to End the War on Terror, The Case Against War with Iran, Central Banking and War, Uncle Sam and the Arab Spring, The Ongoing War on Civil Liberties, and of course, Why Everything in the World is Woodrow Wilson's Fault. But I'm happy to talk about just about anything else you've ever heard me cover on the show as well. So check out youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show for some examples, and email scott at scotthorton.org for more details. See you there.